first major non-introductory discussion. And we're going to talk about a lot of different stuff, obviously not all today, but we should be able to cover um, some information about ERP architecture and how it has evolved over the years. Um, the core modules, we largely talked about that already, so I probably need to update the slide. I, I do mention them again here, but, but we're not going to talk about them at great length. We've already talked a little bit about SAP Business Suite and NetWeaver, but I want to talk more about that, and I also want to talk a little about, about SAP HANA. We will talk about the classes of data in ERP systems. Um, we'll start talking about organizational data, and we'll start making connections back to some of the lab work that you have done. We're going to start talking about material data and talk about the material master, which is one of our first pieces of master data that we will dig into with a fair degree of detail. And then we'll talk about something that I've alluded to already, which is the document concept, which is how data actually moves around the system in the form of various types of documents that have various types of payload. And also as a part of this, we will talk about transactional versus analytic data handling, how that is handled currently in ERP systems, and how that changes when we move to SAP HANA and SAP's newest product, SAP S4. So we've got a lot of stuff to talk about here, so I'm quite confident this will represent uh, what is left of our time together today and probably all of our time together next week as well. So that's what we have on the agenda. This slide right here is actually a pretty important one that I want to annotate quite a bit to set the stage for what you are going to see happen in the industry over the next few years. Now, as an aside, there are some of you in this class that are business students. I'm going to collectively call you that as opposed to the computing students. There are some times in this class we get really, really, really computery. This is going to be one of those times, okay? So realize that this is not the way the whole semester is going to play out, but realize there are going to be times when it gets really, really computery. The corollary to that is there's going to be times when we start talking about things like accounting, and you guys are going to be like, oh, I understand that, and the computer students are going to want to beat their head against the wall. So there's something hard in this class for everyone. This is going to be the stuff that is perhaps a little bit more foreign to our, our business students. What this diagram is illustrating, and this is an official SAP diagram that they, they trot out on, on occasion. This is an illustration of how SAP technology has evolved over time. But it's kind of missing a couple of things as well that, that we will fill in. If this bottom axis here represented time, then really where this diagram should start is in the 1970s when SAP came out with a product that they elected to call System R. Now, some of this, depending upon what you remember from courses you've taken previously, some of this some of you might remember. But the idea behind System R was the people that founded SAP worked for IBM. They were computer developers, they were programmers that worked for IBM. All of them were PhDs in computer science. But they realized that there was a real connection between what they were doing in computer programming and needs that businesses had. This idea of automating business processes and allowing companies to use computers to help them manage this, they really had a vision for the potential there. So they went to their bosses at IBM and said, we would like to create this software. And IBM basically said, look, it's not a bad idea, but we're not prepared to do it. 
at this point in time, IBM was going through kind of a hard time in the 70s. And IBM had decided to focus on hardware. This is when they were investing a lot of money in mainframe development. And IBM, IBM has, is a company that's been around a long time and they've been very successful, but they have had to reinvent themselves a lot. And at this time, IBM was really focusing on hardware. So IBM said, look, we don't think you have a bad idea, but we're not really prepared to jump on board. And so these five IBMers decided to quit IBM and start their own company to create this software. Now, even though they quit IBM, it's not like IBM hated them. As a matter of fact, IBM very much wanted them to succeed. And that's because IBM realized that every time they went out and sold a company on the merit of their system, the company would need hardware to run it on. And IBM, you know, as a hardware vendor, wanted a lot of companies to buy computers. So they realized that, hey, if this other company is successful, then that's going to be good for us. And in fact, IBM and SAP are big partners even today. IBM is very fond of saying that there are more IBMers that work with SAP technology than there are SAP employees. And it's because of this kind of history between those two companies. So these gentlemen quit their job at IBM and started SAP and created this software called System R. Now, why did they call it System R? Why did they pick the letter R? The big focus for them, the big piece of value that they said they were going to deliver to business is the ability to manage your business in real time. No more you put things on paper and you pass paper around and by the time anybody sees something on paper, the information's far, far out of date. Their vision was people would interact with the system using computer screens. You know, really long before Bill Gates was talking about putting a computer on everybody's desk, SAP was promoting that vision as well. So the very first product that they brought to market was System R. It ran on a mainframe computer. As a matter of fact, it ran on punch cards. During the early days of SAP, they didn't own a, com they didn't own a computer. They would rent computers from businesses in the area that shut down at night. So they would, you know, they, this is literally a company that started in a garage in Germany. They would program all day and then take their punch cards to rented computers in the evening, run their punch cards through the system, and they used that to create the software until they generated enough money to actually buy their own computer and have their own non-garage office space. So they got started in the 1970s largely just selling to German companies in, in their locale. But they got off to a good beginning. A lot of companies were very receptive to their message. But in the grand scheme of architecture, System R was a mainframe-based system, meaning that the users interacted with the system through what we would call now a dumb terminal. So there was a mainframe computer that was the, the brain, and then there were all these terminals that, that really had no brain in them at all. That's why we call them dumb terminals. And so when the employee would type information in here, all that information would get sent back to the mainframe, and the mainframe would send a response. We call this a monolithic application because it's all just one giant piece of software that sits on this mainframe computer. Now, during the 1970s, that's the way all software pretty much was. You had mainframe computers, you had dumb terminals, you had punch cards, and that's the way businesses ran their software. Well, System R did well. SAP continued to grow, and so in the late 1970s, so, you know, this is early 1970s. Now, in the late 1970s, they came out with their next version. 
you know, just like Microsoft comes out with new versions of operating systems and new versions of their office products, SAP came out with their next version of their software, which they called R2. Now, at that point, they realized that they needed to go back and rename the original product, so people started calling this original product R1 to distinguish it from R2. It's kind of back when first there was Windows, and then when you wanted to have the next version, you realized, oh, we kind of need to go back and rename the original one so that people know what we're talking about. Now, R2 still used the mainframe architecture but it did have a number of new features. When they were designing System R, SAP realized that there was merit in developing their own programming language to develop the system in. And they had this very interesting vision. They thought that they could train end users to be programmers. Part of their vision was that you wouldn't have to be a computing professional to be able to write transactions and develop software. And so they thought they could create a fourth generation language that would make it so anybody could learn to program. They actually worked really, really hard in Germany in this decade to get ABAP to be taught in schools. That didn't fly, okay? The world might be very different if the German school system decided that they were going to teach reading, writing, arithmetic, and ABAP programming. But that never happened, okay? But R2 was written in this ABAP programming language. Some of you have taken enterprise programming where you have learned the ABAP programming language. For some of you, that may be yet to come. But ABAP, from that point forward, is the language that SAP used to develop their applications. Well, R2 was actually on the market for quite a while. R3 doesn't debut until the 1990s. So we have about a 20-year period where R2 is the dominant technology. Now, they're releasing maintenance updates and service packs and things like that. But there's not a lot of significant changes during this era. It is during the decade of the 1980s that SAP really begins to sell their product globally. And a lot of American companies first bought SAP during the R2 era in the 1980s. Eastman Chemical, one of the first American, well actually at that time was Eastman Kodak, one of the first American companies to buy SAP software. They bought it during the 1980s. I have talked to people that are still working out at Eastman that were part of the original meetings in the 1980s with SAP about their product. They have some really, really interesting stories to tell. But, S or, but Eastman was one of the first American companies to install the software and start running it in the 1980s. There were some problems, or at least there were some problems foreseen as we're going from the 1980s into the 1990s. And that is, this mainframe architecture does not scale very, very well. If we have 20 users interacting with a mainframe computer using dumb terminals, not a problem. If we have 200 users, that's probably not a problem. But what if we have 20,000 simultaneous users? This now becomes a really, really big problem. And so SAP and their partner companies began to look at this issue of how can we change our architecture? And so the key thing that happened in the 1990s when they released R3 was they moved to a three-tiered architecture. Now, many of you have probably heard me say this before, and I say this a lot because this is one of my pet peeves. I have heard a lot of people say, well, they called it R3 because it was a three-tiered architecture. They called it R3 because three is the next number that comes after two. 
Okay, it's just kind of a happy coincidence that R3 provided that, that three-tiered architecture. Now, I'm going to come back to this slide, but, but what is a three-tiered architecture? A three-tiered architecture says, okay, we no longer have a mainframe and then just dumb terminals. Instead, we're going to have perhaps a mainframe or certainly a large computer system that sits at the heart of our infrastructure that will provide all of the data storage. We commonly call this the data layer. You'll sometimes see this referred to as the persistence layer because it's where all the information is stored on an ongoing and persistent basis. But what we'll do is we'll have one computer that's in charge of storing all the data. And then we'll have another computer, or as illustrated here, a set of computers that actually has the business logic. If you will, this is where the core functionality of our SAP ERP software will be on these application layers. The database layer just stores information and retrieves it. The application layer is the driver. It tells it what to store and what to retrieve and how our business processes should work. So now, instead of having one mainframe that has all of the responsibility for computation, now we have this database layer, this application layer, and then instead of the client being just a dumb terminal, our clients pick up sophistication as well because these can now be personal computers or laptops or other things of this sort that run their own software that's called the presentation layer. So this is why you install the SAP GUI on your machine. That's the presentation layer. In order to actually use the system, you log in to the application server. And you don't ever directly interact with the database server you interact here, and then the application server interacts here. But the merit of this structure is we can have one or a very small set of redundant database servers. We can have as many of these application servers as we need, and every one of these application servers can serve a very large set of end user client computers. Now there are some things about this diagram that are also worth talking about. Let me ask you a, a challenging slash question that there's probably no wrong answer to. Of these three layers, which of these is getting the most attention today? Okay, I have a vote for the database layer. And like I said, there's probably no wrong answer to this question. Why do you say the database layer is getting a lot of attention today? Okay, so there's a lot of effort around enhancing and improving the performance of this database layer. The faster this guy can work, the faster the whole system works. A good example of this will be when you go to Google and you type in a search request and you hit the enter key and Google responds in like 0.1 seconds. I trust you realize that it did not go out and search the entire web in that 0.1 seconds. It has systems that crawl the web on an ongoing basis, store all of that information and use that to respond to your search request. The only way they're going to give you back a response in 0.1 seconds is to have a whole lot of these database servers and for them to be lightning fast. So that same thing becomes a concept that companies are looking at in the context of their information infrastructure. So there's a lot of attention being paid to the data layer these days trying to improve the performance of the database server. What other layer gets attention? Yes, sir. Okay, why does the presentation layer get a lot of love these days?
Absolutely. This is the part of the system that our, our people see the most of. And so while this diagram here is showing what looks to me like laptops, we should realize that now the presentation layer is not limited to just PCs and laptops. This could be iPads, iPhones, really any kind of device that has a computer in it could become part of this infrastructure. So an employee could whip out their iPad and that iPad could have some apps on it that when they launch those apps, those apps interact with the application server which gathers the information and presents it back to them on their device. So while this is showing laptop computers, realize that the presentation layer could be just about anything anymore that has a computer brain in it. And there's a whole lot of attention being paid to, I don't know where my iPhone is, oh, it's in my pocket, you know, how can we deliver functionality to this that people would find useful? And earlier today, I gave you an example of that when we were talking about workflow, and I said an employee fills out a vacation request, and the message is sent by way of email to a manager's device, and they respond to it. That's an example of the kinds of things that a lot of companies are, are looking at. So realize that although we associate the SAP GUI as being the presentation layer, there's a whole lot of other things that could be a part of this. Okay, so to go back, R3 gave us this three-tiered architecture. And it gave us this client-server model of computing. Client-server is simply the idea of you have different systems that interact with one another for the sake of providing functionality. It's the same fundamental model that the World Wide Web is based on. So it's become fairly universal in computing. So that was R3. Time goes by. SAP is ready for their next release. I do not know what possesses computer professionals to not like, or computer companies, to not like sequential numbers. I don't know how we go from, what is it, Windows 3.1 to, what was next, Windows Millennium Edition to Windows 95 to Windows 97. I think actually ME probably came after 97. And then at some point we go back to Windows 7 and we go from Windows 7 to Windows 8 to 8.1 to 10. It's like nobody taught people how to count, okay? Well, SAP kind of did that too. They got to this point and they said, okay, we're ready for our next release, but we're not gonna call it R4. We're gonna rename ourselves and we're gonna call our flagship product instead SAP ERP. And from now on, they pledged that it's all going to be SAP ERP version whatever. And then SAP went through this really, really funny phase in the, in the early 2000s, the late 1990s, where it's kind of like Microsoft. I don't know if any of you have read much about this, where a lot of people allege that Bill Gates and Microsoft didn't see the popularity of the Internet and World Wide Web coming. And so at one point, Bill Gates to show the world how important the internet was in Microsoft, he wrote this memo that he sent to all Microsoft employees that talked about how important the internet was and how the internet was at the heart of all of their software development and they were going to become the internet company on the planet. Well, a lot of companies kind of were competing to say to the world, we are the most internet company in the world. So to illustrate that, SAP went through this whole era where they started calling all of their products the name of the product dot com. And so they started selling SAP ERP dot com and SAP CRM dot com. 
and they started dropping .com on the end of all of their product names to show how hardcore they were about the internet. And then, because marketers love to rename stuff, particularly if they work for SAP, they wanted to emphasize how friendly the software was. And so to make it more friendly, they decided, just like Apple went through this era where they put the letter I in front of everything, SAP was going to put the word my in front of everything to show how friendly they were to customers. So they started marketing mysaperp.com. So they did a lot of renaming of the product during this time. And when you look back on it, I, I hope they're somewhat embarrassed by that. It's kind of silly in retrospect. But around the year 2000, they really did a lot of this renaming of what fundamentally was the same product. During this time, they standardized on SAP ERP. That's when they rolled out the business suite. That's when they really emphasized SAP NetWeaver. And they moved to an environment that was focused. It was still a three-tiered architecture, but they embraced SOA, which is service-oriented architecture. Now, for some of you, this is going to be something that you're already very familiar with, but for some of you, perhaps less so. What we really have here is kind of a progression. And I guess I'll put it on the screen here as opposed to the whiteboard. You know, we have monolithic, which was one big computer. And then we realized that wasn't that great. So we moved to a multi-tiered architecture where we had the three different layers or three different tiers. And that served us very well. But then there was a realization that maybe we could change the way we focused on this as well. And maybe instead of thinking of three tiers, maybe what we really have is an architecture where we have a lot of independent modules as opposed to these large-scale tiers. And the idea is that every one of these little modules or little pieces provides a very simple set of functionality. And all these pieces interact with one another to fulfill that functionality. That's the idea behind service-oriented architecture. Service-oriented architecture is a software extension of something that engineers and other industries have done for a long time. If one of our class projects were to design a car, and let's assume we actually had the skill to do that, which I know I don't have, maybe some of you have, but but is certainly outside of the scope of this class for us to really do. But if we worked for GM or Ford or whoever, and, and we were going to design a new car, we would not start from scratch and say, OK, what's this engine going to look like? And we would design it totally from scratch. And then we would say, OK, what's our carburetor going to look like? or our fuel injection system, we would design it from scratch. That's not the way this works. When we create a new car, we think about cars that have gone in the past, and we think about components that we already make that we could use in this new car. And so we might use the same fuel pump that we've been using in cars for the last five years. We might use the same transmission system that we use in several of our other cars. So when we create a new car, we're introducing some new pieces, but we're also reusing a lot of pieces that we know work well and are already part of what it is that we manufacture. Well, that's the idea behind service-oriented architecture. A company, instead of thinking of creating these monolithic software applications that are huge and perhaps represent 
tens of millions of lines of code. By the way, I have been told, but have no way of verifying it myself, that the core SAP ERP module is over 125 million lines of code. It's a big software package, okay? Instead of thinking of this as large software packages, maybe instead we think of it like a car, where it's a collection of a lot of parts that work together. And so we have a lot of different software pieces or modules that interact with one another. That's the idea behind service-oriented architecture. Now, some of the benefits of service-oriented architecture. If you thought of these little services like building blocks, or if you will, like a Lego set, where you have lots of different pieces, that have lots of different sizes and colors. If you thought of this as kind of the software equivalent of that, where you have lots of different software tools that do lots of different things. The idea here is that once a company developed a large collection of these software services, they could let customers link them together to create their own unique applications using this Tinker toy using this Lego set of pieces. You know, just like somebody could dump out a 500 piece set of Legos and one person could use it to build a race car and someone else could use it to build an airplane and someone else could use it to build the Death Star with the same pieces, maybe we could think in terms of taking our software and breaking it up into these services and allowing customers to create their own applications. Now, in the grand